Okay, thank you so much, Nimoy. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome. You just made it in time, so <laughs> that's good. So uh, nice to see you all again. And uh, it's nice to be here in Malaysia. I don't come here that often once a year, but once a year is just right. Yeah, That makes the Dhamma more fresh and more interesting. Yeah? If you saw it, if I saw me every day after a while, you go, oh, boring. Yeah, same old monkey. <laughs> It's good that we only sometimes it's good not to see each other too often. Uh, it makes it more interesting here. Yeah. And uh, tonight's Dhamma talk is going to be on the idea of right view. Uh, and just as Ni Wern, Ni Wern was saying, I was going to say venerable Ni Wern, but not, not, not venerable yet, but maybe venerable to be at one point. Uh, Ni Wern was saying is that uh, uh, so often when we think about what really matters in Buddhism, uh, one of the things we think about a lot is the idea of mindfulness. Uh, mindfulness going around the world, uh, yeah, being kind of picked up by people everywhere, non-Buddhist and Buddhist alike. Uh, but is that really what is the core of Buddhism? Uh, what is uh, the essence of Buddhism? What is the most important thing on the Buddhist path? Uh, so right view, and then they started to realize, actually, right view is not enough. Uh, we also need ethics. Uh, so morality kind of came into the equation. Yeah, so we have... Um, meditation, mindfulness, and ethics coming together. So they got that part of it. Uh, but actually even more fundamental, uh, the one thing that makes Buddhism into Buddhism, the one thing that is the real discovery of the Buddha, is none of these things, because mindfulness existed before the Buddha. Yeah, it is, you know, the idea of just being aware existed already. Ethics certainly existed before the Buddha, but what did not exist before the Buddha or after the Buddha is right view. It is the insight of the Buddha, the Buddha's understanding of the nature of the world, that is what makes Buddhism special, what makes it unique. Yeah? And so right view is really one of those extraordinarily interesting things, uh, precisely because it is unique. And the thing that we really need to focus on, uh, if you want this path to work properly, and if we want all the various aspects of, of our our practice to flourish, uh, then right view is what we really have to focus on here. Uh. And it's kind of interesting, yeah, you look at things like, and this is one of the points I want to make tonight, uh, is that you look at the various aspects of the path, they like take virtue or morality, uh, actually virtue morality too is founded on the idea of right view. Uh. If you have a really powerful right view, uh, this is what I'm going to show you tonight, uh, yeah, so I hope you're ready for this. Uh, if you don't want to be virtuous, now is the time to leave, yeah, because you're gonna, after leaving here, no choice, there's no turning back anymore, you're going to become a really good, goody goody after this. So. <laughs> so, but right view is the most powerful supportive factor for morality, yeah? and that is something I think people don't often understand, yeah, and again, I will talk about this very, very soon. Yeah? So, uh, the uh, thing about right view uh, is that uh, when we talk about the Buddha, the Buddha is the awakened one, right? The Buddha means to awaken, it means to be awake. There are some European languages like Russia, in the Russian language they say, oh, are you Buddha? Yeah, Buddha, I'm awake. Yeah, that's kind of what it means in Russian. So it means actually wake, awake. So when you go to Russia, you can say, I am Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> and without actually lying, without really getting out of it. So be careful of that one, though, because you might kind of get into dodgy, uh, kind of treacherous waters of that one. So, uh, um, but uh, so the Buddha means the one who is awake, yeah? and the idea of awakening means that you kind of you draw back the darkness, uh, yeah, you draw back the dream of the world, uh, you draw back the veil, the curtains from reality, uh, and you see reality as it actually is. Uh, and in the suttas, uh, the Buddha is called the Loke Chakku. Uh, Loke is the world. Uh, yeah, Chakku is the eye. Uh, he's the eye in the world. Uh, and the idea is that the Buddha wakes up, the Buddha sees the world as it actually is. Uh, and then based on that, he passes that information on to us. Uh, this is what the world is like. Uh, and if the world is like this, uh, that has certain consequences. Uh, what are the consequences? Uh, the Noble Eightfold Path are the consequences of seeing the world in the right way. And that is why right view stands at the beginning of the Noble Eightfold Path, right? Uh, the consequences flow from that is a practice uh, that we are doing uh, because of that right view. Uh, so uh, the right view, in a sense, uh, is a gift that the Buddha gave to humanity. Uh, 
And this is kind of really extraordinary here. We often think of the gifts in the world, the gifts of humanity. We think of them as in a very kind of small terms. If someone gives you a gift, you feel very happy about it. But actually, all of these ordinary gifts in life, yes, they are kind. Yes, we should feel gratitude for that because gratitude is a higher kind of mental quality. Yeah, you know that idea from the suttas? If you have gratitude, you are called a sapurisa. Sapurisa means like a superior person. Huh? Superior people have gratitude. Huh? Yeah, so gratitude is one of those beautiful qualities to develop. But the highest gratitude huh, should be reserved for the Buddha. Why? Because the Buddha gave us the highest gift. He gives the ability to see the world as it actually is. And based on that seeing the world as it actually is, we can then make good decisions. And when we make good decisions, it will be for our long-term benefit and welfare. If you have a wrong view, wrong ideas about the world, how can you possibly make good decisions? Impossible, because you're basing your ideas on the entirely the wrong way of thinking about things. So it's very powerful. It's an extraordinary gift that the Buddha gave us. And so it is rather remarkable that people don't take it more seriously. Why is it that we don't take the right view of the Buddha so seriously? I always wondered about that. Yet to me, after a while, it took a while before I got this. But after a while, I realized if the Buddha says that there is such a thing as a rebirth, if the Buddha said that, then surely it must be true, right? Why do people doubt rebirth when the Buddha says there is rebirth? It's kind of fascinating. I, we went to a conference in Singapore just a few months ago, and uh, we had talking about rebirth and all of these kind of things. Uh, and uh, I kind of it's good fun to be at a conference. Yeah, you can you can kind of say things that are a little bit more interesting and stir things up because that's kind of the point of a conference. You have a bit of debate and these sort of things. Uh, and so I said because I had to give a talk at this conference. I said, well, you know, we have all of these ideas about rebirth, all of these supposed evidence for rebirth, children remembering past lives, near-death experiences, um, terminal lucidity experiences, people having memories through uh, uh, past life regressions, whatever it is. There's all this kind of whole suit of ideas yeah, or evidence that supports the idea of rebirth. But uh, I think all of this evidence that we have for rebirth uh, is nothing. Uh, it doesn't really count for very much. There is one piece of evidence for rebirth that is far more important than all of these other ones together. And that evidence, if you are a Buddhist, is that the Buddha said there is rebirth. That is the most important thing. And when I say those things, people think you are nuts. Yeah, what do you mean? The Buddha said that. That's not evidence at all. It's just some ancient book. Yeah, it's kind of written there, there is rebirth. What does that mean? It means nothing, but of course it means something. Yeah? And the reason it means something is because the Buddha is a teacher. Yeah, the, the Buddha is like, if you go to school, yeah, if you go to school and you listen to the teacher, and the teacher says one plus one is two, huh? what do you say? Do you say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir? Or do you say, what rubbish, one plus one is not two? I don't believe a word of it. Uh, yeah, or you, or you hear some fact about history, yeah, Second World War or First World War, like, no, I don't believe any of that nonsense, yeah, there was no First World War. Huh? Of course you don't, yeah, you accept these things because the teacher says so. Why would the teacher lie to you? Huh? The teacher will tell you the truth, yeah, normally. So presumably there was a Second World War, maybe not every fact about the Second World War is exactly as it is in the books you read, but roughly the idea that there was a war is certainly going to be true. And yet these ordinary teachers in school, who are they anyway? They're just ordinary people. What do they know? They don't know very much, yeah. They have been taught by someone else. They have been reading some book. They are just kind of regurgitating what they have been told before from someone else. They don't really know exactly what happened. The one plus one may very well not be two, yeah. That may actually be wrong. And yet rebirth is far more certain because the Buddha is not that kind of teacher. The Buddha is not someone who regurgitates the truth from someone else. The Buddha is someone who discovers the truth. The Buddha is a person with incredible integrity, whose moral conduct you can be fully, feel fully sure about. When you read the suit, as you realize that this is a person with exceptional qualities, someone extraordinary. If there is one teacher in the world that you should follow, you should listen to, 
Forget about the teacher who says one plus one is two, but listen to the Buddha. Far more likely that the Buddha is right than that your teacher in school is right. Sometimes we listen to the wrong people. Yeah. Please, you know, when you go to school, you can kind of challenge your teacher. I don't believe a word of the Second World War business, but don't challenge the Buddha, because the Buddha is much more likely to be right. You still want to listen to this talk? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes people think you are nuts when you speak like this. This, this monkey he had kind of he been too long in the forest. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he has lost his mind a little bit. What is he talking about? This doesn't make any sense at all. Right? And one of the reasons why people don't think this makes any sense uh, is because we are so far away in culture and in time from the Buddha. Yeah, the Buddha existed two and a half thousand years ago. Right? existed in a different culture in India, yeah? So it seems the Buddha almost, when you think about the Buddha, it's kind of hard to really make it out. Is he legendary? Is he a mythological figure? Is he real? You don't have that sense, sense of realness about the Buddha. A teacher in school, you can see them right there in front of you, so of course they are real. But the Buddha doesn't have that sense of reality. But obviously the Buddha was a human being, who existed in, a, in this society of ours, in this world of ours, two and a half thousand years ago. There's no doubt that there was a person called the Buddha. We have the suttas, the way he talked about things, yeah, two and a half thousand years later. And the only reason why we can't really relate to him as a human being in this way yeah, is because we think about the Buddha in the wrong way. Yeah, yeah the Buddha is a real historical person. He's a human being just like us who walked this planet. And the fact that there's two and a half thousand years ago actually is largely irrelevant. Why is it irrelevant? Because the human mind is the same, right? Isn't that, isn't that true? Yeah, when you kind of see the human mind, when you travel around the world, you see the various cultures, you see what people are like. What are they like? They are the same. Yeah, we are kind of, and when you, then you read the suttas, and again, you see that human beings two and a half thousand years ago were largely the same. They would get angry, they would go up to Buddha and say, yeah, nonsense, I don't believe a word of what you're saying. Nothing has changed, right? <laughs> or, you know, you read the suttas, you see what people, how they were living their lives. Everyone wants to be happy. Everyone wants to overcome suffering. People falling in love, people crying when their loved ones are dying. People are the same. It's exactly the same. The human heart, the human mind, what we actually want to get out of our lives is basically exactly the same. Nothing has changed. The fact that it was two and a half thousand years ago is kind of irrelevant. Human, the basic human ideas don't actually change over time or geography. And so for these reasons, we should be very careful about kind of making our present time, giving that priority. There is, you know, you may know that in psychology, there are all these kind of different biases that human, humans have. We have all kinds of biases, yeah? It's very hard to see the world straight. And one of these biases is called present bias, whereby we prioritize the present time over historical time. We think that present time, we are more advanced, we are more important, we have iPhones, yeah? The Buddha didn't have an iPhone, right? So <laughs> how could you be advanced without the iPhone? How can you be advanced without kind of peering into the, uh, the galaxies and the, uh, what are they called, the quasars, you know, of, of 10 billion light years away? I mean, you know, obviously we are far more advanced now. Right? But actually, that is not necessarily always true. Yeah, in some areas, maybe we are more advanced, in some areas not. This is called the present bias, whereby you assume that everything we do is more advanced. But actually, normally, in many ways, I think we have gone backwards. Yeah, how many Buddhas around these days? Very few, yeah. Not so many Buddhas around. The Buddha existed two and a half thousand years ago, not now. So some things we have actually lost. And uh, so uh, this is uh, the idea. We need to get in touch with the Buddha again. Uh, we need to understand who the Buddha was as a human being. Uh, and when you get in touch with the Buddha as your teacher, uh, as the one, the eye of the world, the eye in the world, who understood the reality as it actually is, uh, when you understand the Buddha in that way, uh, then you start to take his message far more seriously, more seriously than you take the message of your teacher in school, uh, 
Why? Because the Buddha has far more credibility than the teacher in school. This is how you start to think. And then when the Buddha says there's rebirth, you don't, you actually start to think, well, if the Buddha says it, I better take it seriously here. Okay, maybe I just can't just accept it just like that, but at least I need to take it seriously. I need to consider it very carefully. Yeah, and this is how then you start to kind of come to this idea of right view. You have been given the largest gift, the most precious gift, the most important gift that any human being can give anyone else. Access to the highest happiness, access to the insight into the nature of reality, the overcoming of all suffering. What higher gift can there possibly be than that? This is the greatest thing any human being can give to anyone else. And sometimes we say no thank you to that gift. Sometimes we are crazy, you know. So are you going to be crazy? We are going to be smarter. Let's be a little bit less crazy, because this is kind of what the Buddhist path is about. It's about awakening, being less crazy and being more intelligent about how we view the world and how we live our lives. So what happens? When we start taking the Buddha seriously in this way, and we start thinking about uh, the idea of right view, yeah? and I will give you some examples of what this idea of right view really is about. And I'll give you some very practical examples so that you can actually implement these things in your own life, because that is where really right view starts to matter. And so I will give you some very obvious ideas for how this works. So one of the uh, kind of big problems in the world today that people talk about, uh, so let's talk about real issues rather than theoretical things. Uh, yeah, one of the big problems is all the issues that seem to be exist in the world. Uh, yeah, all the problems that we have in the world. Uh, and you will probably have noticed, uh, have you noticed war, the wars in Ukraine? Yeah, you heard about that? Yeah, okay, so war in Ukraine, war in the Middle East. Uh, yeah, lots of refugees because of that. Uh, climate crisis perhaps, uh, uh, crisis and environmental concerns in general, uh, political instability, the kind of great powers, China and the US, maybe that looks like they want to go to war. Uh, yeah, third world war, maybe just around the corner. No, I don't know about that. I'm just kind of adding that for effect. Yeah, but it's kind of sometimes it feels a bit like that, right? Uh, and uh, so there's all this kind of instability in the world. Uh, and then there is the crisis with, you know, young people being more depressed than the previous generations and these kind of things that we see everywhere. Uh, and so what does Buddhism have to say about this? Because uh, this is kind of interesting, right? Uh, and when you hear that people get sad and depressed and uh, downbeat because of all the problems in the world, uh, the reason why they get sad about the, these things is because they think that their future is at stake. And who would they blame? They blame the older generation, yeah? So you are younger than so you blame like people like me. Is that true? <laughs> you say, why you monks? Yeah, you have kind of, you haven't done what you should be doing on this planet or whatever. I don't know if you do that. I'm just kind of making it up, yeah, as we go along. Yeah. You probably don't do that. I'm sure you don't. But this is kind of how the dynamics are, yeah? So you get upset and angry and you get sad about the state of the world because you think your future is not looking very good, yeah? If there's going to be a third world war, if there's going to be a climate crisis, if all the ice in Antarctica is going to melt, uh, yeah, I live quite close to Antarctica, I live in Australia, yeah, so the water is going to come there first if it, if it melts. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of, oh, this flood, the tsunami coming from Antarctica, I think maybe that's going to happen next. Uh, uh, so, uh, so you think that your future is destroyed. Uh, and of course, if you think your future is destroyed, uh, you have good reasons to be a bit depressed, right? Uh, <laughs> it doesn't sound so good. Uh, but is it really true that your future is destroyed? Uh, what is it that creates our future according to the Buddhist teachings? Uh, and according to the Buddhist teachings, our future is not created so much by what happens in the world outside. Uh, the world outside is going to have a little bit effect on our future. But the real future, according to Buddhism, is created by how we live our lives. If you live your life well, if you live with kindness and compassion, if you develop your mind, if you have a good heart, then you will also have a good future. Yeah, that is how you build the future. This is the idea of karma. It is as simple as that. 
you have a good future in this life. Why? Well, because you become very resilient and very strong if you have these qualities. Uh, but of course, also, you have a good future as regards future lives and all these kind of things. Uh, so that is how we develop the future, by living well. And isn't that a beautiful message for the world? Uh, when the whole world is up in arms, when the whole world says that we are drowning, everything is going wrong, the floods are going to come and they're going to destroy us, and Antarctic ice sheet is going to collapse, and we'll have the tsunami around the world, and there's going to be refugees and problems. And we say, okay, all of these things are bad, but we have a solution as Buddhists. The solution is simply to live well. And if you live well, you are going to have a future, good future, regardless of what happens in the world. So this is such an optimistic and beautiful idea. It means that we can actually, yes, of course, the world may be going through difficulties and we can help that to the best of our ability, but actually we can safeguard our own individual future simply by the fact that we live well. Yeah, this is the Buddhist message to the world. So please spread this message. Are you going to do, spread this message? <laughs> You have to give a promise right here and now, yeah? Because if you give a promise here and now to me, it means you can't kind of backtrack later on. Uh. <laughs> Isn't that kind of great? Uh, I think we don't hear these kind of messages anywhere else. Uh, it is only a Buddhist who is capable of delivering this message uh, because it is only as Buddhists that we kind of talk about the development of the mind and that is the future of who we are. You need to have a Buddhist attitude to understand this kind of truth. This is the power of the insight of the Buddha. This is how the understanding of the world, according to the Buddha, why it becomes so powerful. Because we can deal with the most pressing and the most difficult issues of humanity in a constructive fashion. Yes? No? Maybe? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Okay, whoa, I'm glad I'm reaching, reaching you. That's really good. Uh, I'm always a bit concerned. People say, uh, maybe, don't know. Okay. <laughs> so it's fair enough. You don't have to agree with me, you know? It's kind of a. Uh, anyway, so this is the first thing I wanted to talk about very briefly. Uh, just the idea of how to deal with some of the really important and difficult issues in our time. Uh, these all issues kind of taken into one in this way. So now I'm going to have a bit of coffee first before I carry on. I think I'm going to get a bad reputation for all this coffee drinking, actually. It's going to be... Uh, bad. <laughs> Probably had a bad reputation already, probably too late, so nothing to lose. So I carry on drinking coffee, that's what I make it. So... Um, this is the first one. The second thing I want to talk about is the idea of morality. I think very often we don't understand where morality comes from. Very often we think that morality comes from mindfulness. What do you think? Is, it, is that how to be moral, to be more mindful? Is that the best way? You know this is a trap, right? So that's why <laughs> you're very careful with saying it. I think very wise of you. So of course, mindfulness is helpful because if you're mindful, you have a bit of awareness of what you're doing. But uh, the reality is that in daily life, yeah, when you're busy with your smartphone and you're kind of running around looking after two and a half children and one job and a car and a house and hobbies and BG, uh, the, B the BGF and all these kind of things, sometimes you lose your mindfulness. Yeah, sometimes I'm amazed. I see people walking around the streets with a smartphone, texting and filming and doing everything while they're walking and dodging lampposts and people. And it's kind of crazy. Yeah, we live in this mad world. Uh, so I don't know how what that feels like because I don't have a telephone at all, which is kind of great. Uh, if you give me a smartphone, I barely know what to do with it. Uh, and I'm really proud of that, to be honest. Uh, so we have a kind of strange way of having pride as Buddhist monks. That's kind of my pride, and not having a smartphone. Uh, and uh, so you see people, yeah, and very often they are not mindful at all. And yet, despite that lack of mindfulness, yeah, and actually the first thing I should say is that uh, very often we lose our mindfulness. And because we lose our mindfulness, we still end up doing bad things. Yeah, you want to live a moral life, you want to do the right thing, but because you lose your mindfulness, then you lose your temper a little bit. You say something bad, oh, 
I sent something bad. And it's too late. It's already escaped your mouth. Yeah. As they say, you should be more careful about what comes out of your mouth than what goes into your mouth. Like the old saying, yeah. That's a nice saying. We are too concerned about what goes in. Actually, what goes out is much more important. But so we lose, tend to lose our mindfulness anyway. So we try to mindful that doesn't work, and then we get frustrated. Actually, mindfulness is not all that powerful in ensuring that you live really well. Mindfulness is quite weak, and the reason is because most people don't have that level of mindfulness. Yeah, and you know straight away how mindful you are. You go and sit and meditate, you close your eyes. How mindful are you in watching the breath? It is only a very small number of people who are able to watch the breath continuously in peace for long periods of time. It becomes very obvious that mindfulness is not that strong. And so if mindfulness is not the way or the best way, or only part of the way for living a moral life, then what might be a better way? And I say the better way, a more powerful way, is actually right view. Yeah, right view is the crux and understanding how to live a really moral life. And I will give you an example of how this works. So imagine that you are going around here in KL. You have any any crazy drivers here in KL, right? Is that, <laughs> that's my kind of observation. I'm a, a few crazy drivers. Some are really good. I'm sure most people here are really good drivers, but there are some bad ones out there. Yeah, they're out there somewhere, un unnamed people out there. And so you see these drivers, but what is kind of fascinating, you see someone walking around the streets with a mobile phone, right, being really kind of absolutely mindless, no mindfulness at all, as close as zero as you can possibly come to mindfulness. And despite being completely mindless, having no idea what they are doing, when they come to a street, do they just walk into the street or do they look left and right first of all? They still look left and right, even though they have almost zero mindfulness. And that shows you that mindfulness is not the critical thing for remembering to do something. Yeah? What is the critical thing? The critical thing is that you know this street is incredibly dangerous. If you walk straight into a street with there's lots of traffic, chances you're going to die. It's very high, right? It's very, very high. And because you know that, it is so ingrained in you because you have the right view that this is dangerous. Even though you have zero mindfulness, you still stop. You look left. Actually, that's right. Yeah, sorry. You look right, or maybe you look left first. Which one do you look for? I'm not sure what is going on in Malaysia. You look one way, then you look the other way. Yeah? This is what you do. And then, if the street is clear, and you are ready, and then you walk across, and you don't just walk into the road. And that, what that proves to you is that right view is far more powerful than mindfulness in remembering what is important. Yeah, you look left, you look right. Why? Because you know the danger. And so what we have to do if you want to live really morally, if you want to live a life where you always say the right thing, you act in the right way, you think in the right way, that is the hardest thing of all, always thinking right, yeah? always having metta, always having compassion, it's pretty difficult. Yeah? The way to do that is not to try to have mindfulness, but to have right view. If you understand the danger in saying the wrong thing, in acting the wrong way, in thinking in the wrong way, if you really understand the problem of that, you will never actually do it. There's a very obvious example from the suttas to explain how this works. Yeah, there's one kind of person who is always perfect in morality. That person is the stream mentor, the sotapanna. Why is the stream mentor perfect in morality? Because they have the full right view. That is the reason, right? They know the danger of acting in the wrong way. And because they have that full right view, they always act appropriately. Occasionally they make mistakes, but generally they always act appropriately. That is the power of stream entry. So we should try to approximate to being stream enters, seeing the world in the right way. And as we do that, our morality will come together. This is the power of right view. So what exactly is that right view? How do we make it matter? How do we think about the world in such a way that we are always going to be moral? And one of the most important ideas here is the idea of impermanence. 
Yeah, the idea of unreliability. Yeah? The idea that we don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, when you look at things on TV, you look at the news, it's kind of bleeding obvious. We have no idea what's going to happen next. Yeah? Everything is so chaotic. Everything is so uncertain. Uh, we see people dying in wars. We see people being, we had a bomb. Was it here in KL? We had a bomb recently, right? You don't know where the next bomb is going to be. Uh, I don't know, BGF, I said that this is a dangerous place to be, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> probably not, probably quite safe, but you just don't know what's going to happen around the corner. And it is this understanding of impermanence, understanding of the ever-presence of death, the understanding that we don't know where the world is heading. This tells you that now is the time to do the right thing. You may not have the opportunity tomorrow unless you do it now. I mean, like now, right? Not in two seconds, but now. How can I be moral right now? Like now, what can I say? What can I say to all of you to be moral? I have to say something kind. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me to this wonderful... <laughs> what is the right way of being moral right now? Well, actually, it's just, you know, talking Dhamma is okay, so I don't have to say anything more than that. And saying talking Dhamma in the right way. Talking Dhamma with a sense of... Kindness, yeah, that is really the right way. Yeah? Thinking about the people around me, with either with compassion or with metta. And you too, right now. Have you got compassion or metta right now? Yeah? That is what you should ask yourself. Yeah? If you understand the problem of impermanence, yeah? if you understand the danger of how quickly things change, yeah? how quickly Buddhism is lost in the world, yeah? how quickly samsara just rolls on, yeah? and you have lost the opportunity to do what is right. Yeah? If you see that danger, then of course you will always do the right thing because you know otherwise you're letting yourself down and you're destroying your long-term future. That is where you are destroying your long-term future by not living right in the right way right now. That is where the problem arises. And so this is how you kind of come to this idea, try to understand what is going on. And I would say it is far more dangerous to do what is wrong, yeah, to do a wrong act, to speak in the wrong way, even to think in the wrong way, that is far more dangerous than to walk into that street without looking. Yeah? So if you have a choice, yeah, please walk into that street without looking, yeah, rather than saying something bad. Yeah? So this is kind of this is what I say, this is my challenge to you. This is what right view does to you. It kind of sets the priorities right. Yeah? Walking into the street. The worst that can happen is that you die, yeah? Okay, so you die and then you get reborn and then you carry on with your teach teaching with the Buddhism or whatever. At least you haven't kind of lost the plot. At least you haven't kind of put yourself away into a bad state or anything like that, yeah? Nothing has really gone wrong. Death and life, these things are natural parts of our existence anyway. So you have to kind of deal with those things. But if you do something wrong in this world, you are letting yourself down, dragging yourself down, giving yourself a bad future, destroying your prospects for the long run, extending your life in this samsaric existence, yeah? going through all of these problems, then you are seeing things in the right way. So um, this is what I say, right view is the right way to become really a moral person understanding the urgency of doing what is right. Now is the opportunity. The opportunity is not in tomorrow or next hour or in five seconds. The opportunity is always now, right now, is the time to do the right thing. So this is how right view supports morality. Yeah, are you still, am I still making sense? Yeah, making sense to you. Okay, one person is nodding. Okay, a few people are nodding. That's great. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so good, yeah. And so this is just to show you how right view is incredibly powerful. Uh, but this is not the end of the story. Uh, there's more to the idea of right view. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much longer, but I want to talk to you about one more point that I think is really important to really understand the power of right view. Uh, and this is. Uh, we talked about now how to think about the world a little bit, uh, then about morality. The next step is kind of meditation, right? It kind of follows the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh. And so in meditation too, the idea of right view is fundamentally important. Uh. And uh, the reason is because to be able to do meditation practice, uh, yeah, 
you have to be mindful, you have to be aware. And very often you will find, I'm sure everyone here has found this, I know exactly myself what this means. Sometimes your mind is all over the place, thinking about this, thinking about that. Uh, sometimes you're kind of far away, not even in Malaysia anymore, somewhere overseas, yeah, or wherever you are, <laughs> I don't know where you are, some kind of fantasy realm or something. Uh, yeah, the mind is kind of tends very often to be completely all over the place. Uh, and why is that? And the reason is because we take all of these things to be important. Uh, yeah, you take uh, thinking about your life, thinking about your family, about your job, uh, try to create the future by thinking about it. Uh, this is what thinking about the future is really about, yeah, trying to sort it out, trying to solve all the problems in our life. Uh, and so we think about all of these things because we think they are important. Uh, now, what is, so the path of meditation is really the reason why, how it works. Uh, is it because it is a path of letting go? Yeah, and so part of that letting go is precisely the letting go of so many of these concerns that we have about our ordinary life. That is part of the idea of letting go. Yeah, so how can we let go of those things when they are so important to us? Well, the reason we can do that is because we have to reprioritize what actually really is significant in our life. Yeah, and this comes back largely to where I started out. Uh, I started, not exactly started out, but what I said after a while, uh, the idea that our future uh, is created not by thinking about it, uh, not by uh, so solving all the problems in this world, because this world is basically unsolvable. Yeah, each one of us, we are one among eight billion people. How much power do we have? Almost zero power in affecting the world. So we can only do a tiny little bit, so we do our bit. But then we recognize that the world is really out of control. And because the world is out of control, the way to create the future is not by trying to control the world, but again, it comes back to our spiritual practice. Yeah, that is where, that is what we can control. You can control your own mind to some extent. You can decide whether you want to have loving kindness and compassion or whether you want to have ill will and grudges against other people. And so we understand what is important. We understand what our priorities should be. Our priorities should be the spiritual practice. Every time you sit down to try to meditate, prioritize the spiritual practice. Remember what really matters. Remember where the future is made. The future is not created by thinking about it and resolving all the problems, because that is endless. No, the future is created by how you live right in this moment. And if you are able to just relax in your meditation, watch the breath, have a kind of positive feeling about what is happening, having an appreciation for the people around you, having a good heart and all of these kind of things, yeah? If you have that, then you are actually creating the future. And if you get that, if you understand that, uh, then you let go very, very quickly. Uh, there's nothing really in the world worth holding on to. Uh, you stop thinking about it. Uh, yeah, This is the power of right view, uh, understanding what is truly valuable and what is not. Uh, the more you see of these things, the more you see of the unreliability of the world uh, and how kind of uninteresting it is at the end of the day, the more your mind veers over to the spiritual path instead. You take that seriously. Yeah, so what does that mean? Well, it just means you become a bit more kind, you become a bit more caring, a bit more compassionate, a bit more understanding, a bit more wise in your life. That's really all it means. You start to treat people a bit differently. You start to speak with a sense of, uh, how can I give these other people a gift through my speech? Yeah, this is a beautiful way of thinking. How can I be a little bit more like the Buddha? Yeah, can you be a bit more like the Buddha? That's kind of nice, yeah? What is the Buddha like? The Buddha is this beautiful person, gentle, kind and caring, with enormous amount of wisdom. That's the Buddha. Try to be a bit more like the Buddha. Ask yourself before you act, what would the Buddha do in this situation? And if you think the Buddha is too far away, ask yourself, what would Ajahn Brahm do in this situation? Yeah. What would Ajahn Brahm do? Would he tell you off? Would he do something? Would he become angry? Probably not. And then you're going to be on the right track. So right view is this incredibly powerful force. And this is really what I wanted to talk about tonight. 
But it goes even deeper, of course. Uh, it is very supportive of your meditation practice. Uh, and then as your meditation deepens uh, and your meditation becomes very powerful, eventually you get the full right view. Yeah? This is the right view of the Buddha himself. Uh, when you sit down, you close your eyes, you bliss out. Uh, you feel as if there is no difference between you and the rest of the universe. Uh, and you think either you think you're God, or if you're even smarter than that, uh, you become enlightened. Uh, yeah, this is kind of the step beyond God, uh, yeah, when you become fully enlightened. Uh, or you see the world, you become a stream actor, and that is the real right view, where it really manifests for you completely. Uh, and that is where we ultimately would like to go. Uh. So please don't uh, underestimate the power of right view. Uh. Don't forget that this is the foundation of everything in Buddhism. Everything starts with right view. Uh. Without right view, you're going to keep on wandering aimlessly and blindly in samsara for who knows how long. Yeah? Yeah? And you're going to suffer and suffer. You're going to cry and cry. And you're going to be reborn in who knows what kind of dodgy realm. Don't be reborn in those dodgy realms, yeah? because it is painful to be reborn in those dodgy realms. Instead, understand the problem. So understand right view. Yeah? Try to understand what the Buddha really was talking about. Uh, listen to good Tama talks and actually explain these ideas properly so you can understand what they are. Uh, make them real in the sense of make them practical. What does it mean for me when the Buddha says there is rebirth? Uh, when the Buddha says that everything is impermanent, I should develop the perception of impermanence. What does it mean? Uh, what does it mean to develop the perception of death? Uh, all of these things, what do these things mean for me as a person? And then when you start to understand what it means for you as a person, not as an intellectual or theoretical idea, but as a motivating factor that touches you in a deep way. And remember, this is kind of one of the significance of the Dhamma. The significance of the Dhamma is not just as an idea. The significance of the Dhamma is when it touches you in a deep way. You can feel the Dhamma. It is visceral. It's like, wow, now I understand. If you have this feeling, now I understand, and you feel a little bit scared. If you haven't felt a bit scared yet, you don't really understand very much. <laughs> you know what I mean? It is good to feel a little bit scared because that becomes the motivating force that drives you on this path because you have a concern for what is actually going on. Not so scared that you get paralyzed, but a little bit just to motivate you on the path. That is the right way. So right view, cultivate it, reflect on it, make it real in your own life. Then that will then help you to deal with the problems of the world, as I just mentioned before. It will make you a more moral person because you understand the urgency of morality. It will also make your meditation more profound because you will understand what it means to let go and to give things up. And ultimately, it will take you all the way to the end of the Buddhist path. So, right view. Evan. <laughs> okay. That's it. Say something. You can say sadhu now if you like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>